important. That is my important. All right. So I summarism. So let's just get into this. Just doing the brief, brief recap. So how do we tell these isomers, right? So we're going to be looking at these isomers, right? Generally um, stated here, right? So possible relationship between two molecules. So if you have molecules that have the same, if they have the same formula, they're isomers. If they don't have the same molecular formula, they're not isomers, right? Do they have the same co connectivity? If yes, they're stereoisomers. If not, they're constitutional isomers, right? If they're stereoisomers and are non-superimposable mirror images, then they are enantiomers. And if they are not or contain two or more chiral centers, then they will be diastereomers. All right? So stuff like this. Okay? So you're going to be looking at all of these, right? This is also a larger, more complex test, but don't think it's necessary like that. All right? So just doing an overview. So one of the most interesting aspects of organic chemistry is the fact that it's three-dimensional, right, in this case, right? And molecules can actually differ based on those three-dimensional arrangements, right? So if they have the same number of atoms and molecular formula and everything, right, but they're just connected a little bit differently, then they can be discovered as isomers or spoken of as isomers, right? So looking at this, the first type of isomers that we can see are conformational isomers, also known as conformers, right? So they differ from one another by the rotation around a single bond. So rotations can freely occur around single carbon to carbon bonds, unlike double bonds or triple bonds, that, which are locked in their orientation, right? So these are all conformers, right, of pentane, right? So these are all different pop. Um, conformers of pentane. So it means that all of them are pentane, you know, right? They're just bent differently. All right? So that's what conformationalism speaks about in this case. Any issues here? Sir, is there like another, another name for this? Because I recognize it, but I've never heard it called a conformational isomer. Touches syllabus, open syllabus. Give me a moment. Let me see what. The syllabus calls it there i am not sure of another widely used name for these if you guys have a name for it let me know but let me just check something i summarize him to do, 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 do. i'm thinking it could they be wouldn't... positional but, repeat um, i'm thinking it there's something called a positional isomer and i think it's oh. like this I'm not sure that's a bit different Positional isomer is a little bit different. But this is conformationalism. So it just means that it's the same structure, you just can't draw it differently. It can just be seen in nature differently, right? Um, we're going to be looking at positional isomerism, right? So positional isomerism is a type of constitutional isomerism. So these are the, all the types of constitutional isomerism, right? Some of them we'll look at, some of them we won't. So chain isomerism is something we'll look at. Functional group isomerism. Um, Metamerism, it's not in the PowerPoint, but I put it there, right? So metamerism exists, right? And it has to do with hydrants um, in some cases. Um, well, it actually has to do with the position across the functional group, but we're not going to talk about that. Positional isomers, right? As you mentioned, they're ring chain isomerism. Tautomerism, we're not going to be looking at that. So that's one of the things we're not going to be looking at. And we also have chain isomerism, all right? So looking at something like this, so this is functional group isomerism. So it basically means that, you know, the functional group isomerism, right? Let me just read this, right? So it's a type of isomerism in which there is a change in the position of the functional group, right? And the chemical formula of the compound that retains, you know, that really retains it the same, right? So these types of compounds are known as functional group isomers. So it's basically saying that there's a change in the position of the functional groups while the chemical formula really remains the same, all right? So looking at the propanol and propanone, we have this, right? So we have this as a functional group here, the carbonyl group. So if the carbonyl group is located at the end of the chain, it's propanol, but if it's rotated in the middle, then it's propanone. So these two are functional group isomerism. They differ by functional groups, all right? Same thing with ethanol and methoxymethane, right? Same molecular formula and everything, 
but different functional groups. That is what functional group isomerism means, right? Same molecular formula, different functional group, right? Some other um, functional group isomerism, you can see them in carboxylic acids. You can see them in esters as well, right? Um, yeah, so there are different ways you can view them, right? So these are two examples of functional group isomerism, right? Same molecular formula and everything, but different structure, all right? Different functional group, okay? Any questions here? All right. Okay, so let's, let's move on. All right, positional isomerism now. The positional isomer, right, is a type of isomer that shows the difference in the functional group and the bonds in the compound. They are known as positional isomers, and the phenomenon is named positional isomerism. So we change the position, right, of the compound specifically, right, on the molecule. All right, so, well, the functional group, rather, on the molecule. So here we have two different things, right? So we have A, let me just label it. Why is it not being labeled? Crazy stuff. All right. So let's say we have A here. We have B. This molecule is B. Here we have C, and here we have D. All right? D looks weird. D looks, honestly, traumatized. All right. But we have that there. Let me see if D makes, can make a little bit more sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you guys get what I'm saying here, right? But let's see, you know. Are A and B isom isomers? Like, which ones are the isomers, right? A and B, C and D, C and B, A and D. What are the isomers, the positional isomers that you guys see? Which two are isomers of each other? Uh, A and B and C and D. Okay, so A and B are isomers and C and D are isomers, right? positional isomers, but they don't overlap with each other. So D and B are not isomers, right? So we know here that A and B are isomers because they have the same molecular formula, but they just change in the position of their functional group there, right? C and D are isomers, but just change in the position of their functional group, the alkyne functional group there. Alkynes have triple bonds, right? So we have that there. So it just changes the position of their functional group. And that's what positional isomerism is. All right, should not be a problem there, okay? So if we were to name these, right, we have one, two, three, four, as you can see there, right? So there are four carbons, right? Hydroxyl group on the second carbon. What would you name compound A? What is the name of molecule A? Butan 2 um. Butan 2 lovely. All right, or you can say um, 2 butanol, right? And then B would be what? B would be 1 butanol, or it could be just butanol, or uh, butan 1 all. <laughs> All right, so it could be one butanol, right? It could be butan one all, right? Or it could be n butanol. The n just means normal, right? So, and the n would have to be, well, it can be common or capital there, right? So, n butanol can call it that as well, right? So, we have that there, and the rest of them are just alkynes. Right, so it has a triple bond. So it actually have um, let me see. There are five carbons. So it would be pentan two ion, right, and uh, pentan one ion, right. So y and e instead of um e and e. Okay, so we have that there. We also have ring chain isomerism. So the type of isomers in which the isomers has an open chain form and a closed ch chain form, right. So a ring type structure. So these are called ring chain isomerisms. They can be found as a chain or found as a ring. 
So if we look at these one, two, three, four, five, we have pentane here. All right. So what would be the name of the substance in the ring form here? Cyclopentane. Lovely. So it would just be cyclopentane. Right. So that is that. So we have cyclic and aliphatic right here. Well, it's cyclic and aliphatic, right? And then we have chain, which is also aliphatic, right? So we have these two here. So cyclopentane and regular pentane. All right, so those are all the constitutional isomerism that we look at in unit two, right? We look at chain isomerism, functional group isomerism, positional isomerism, ring chain isomerism, and chain isomerism, all right? Well, Oh, I actually re repeated chain isomerism. Let me just remove that from there. Yeah, I repeated that one. Okay. So those are the ones that we were looking at. All right. Moving on to stereoisomerism. Now we have to look at enantiomerism and diastereomerism. All right. So first we have to look at what chirality is. Can anybody just let me know in their own words what chirality is? What is chirality? What does chirality refer to? Chirality is basically when a molecule can mirror itself, but it cannot overlap, basically. So it cannot overlap. So it can create a mirror image, but it's not superimposable. All right. Do you guys completely understand this concept of superimposability? It's a real question. Everybody in this meeting, everybody who can hear me right now, do you guys understand completely the concept of superimposability no, do we on you don't understand completely what it means to su be superimposed yes yeah, sir we don't i, will, I don't <laughs> <laughs> all right so okay so what you're going to do all right you're going to basically reach out your hands all right have your palms facing you all right spread out your fingers have your palms facing you and then overlap your hands on top of each other, all right? Your hands are chiral in nature, all right? Because if they, if you put your hand, if you just put your hands in front of each other, like you're clasping your hands, they can create mirror images. But if you put one on top of each other, right, they don't overlap properly. So they're non-superimposable, but they can create mirror images, all right? Let me see if I can get um, an explanation of chirality from that standpoint. All right. So let me see if I can get an image because I think, yeah, organic chemistry is something that is visual. Okay, so let me just use this diagram. This should work. Give me a moment. Let me just add it to the slide here, and I'll leave it in the slide. All right. So blank. Paste. Yes. All right. So as you can see here, right, this explains the non-superimposability of human hands, right? So your left hand and your right hand can create mirror images, right? Well, if you put them over each other like that, the thumbs are going to be sticking out. They don't properly cover each other. They're non-superimposable. For example, like um, other than something like a flask, which is achiral, right, means that, you know, you can just superimpose a flask. They're generally the same. So it's the same thing with molecules, right? Some molecules are connected in such a way where if you put them inside each other, it's like they're mirror images. But if you overlap them, they don't superimpose properly. Is it making more sense? For the person who asked, does it make more sense? Oh yeah, yes sir. All right, so what I'm going to do while I go through the PowerPoint, I'm going to be making a model. I'm going to turn on my camera and then show you a couple. Well, um, I'm gonna show you what I, a diastereomer. No, not a diastereomer, an enantiomer, right? Um, just give me a moment to build it. But this is basically what it's really talking about. So chirality speaks to the fact that a substance itself can actually be create a mirror image of themselves, right? 
So two substances, they're isomers, they can create mirror images of themselves, but they're non-superimposable. That really tells us whether or not it is um, chiral in nature. And the rule of thumb is that a chiral carbon, right? So on the substance now, the chiral carbon would be the carbon that is con con like connected to different substituents, right? Place at carbons of its tetrahedron, of course, right? That are all different. So a chiral carbon speaks to a carbon that is attached to four different groups. So it has to be four completely different groups, right? It can't work with anything else has to be four completely different groups, all right? Following so far? We still have a question. Go ahead. Could it be that we are questioned on a chiral carbon without, um, without referring to chirality? OK, refers. Could we be given a mm -hmm. could we get a question mm -hmm. where they ask about a car chiral carbon? Basically they're saying to identify a chiral carbon out of a set of organic molecules. Does it necessarily have to link back to chirality, as in the mirror image being non superimposable? Um not necessarily. All right, so there may be questions in which they'll ask you to define, to show us the molecule that is non-superimposable. In that case, no, if you don't understand chirality and the fact that, and whether or not something is an enantiomer, then you won't be able to answer the question. So they won't ask you to define or to find where the chiral carbon is, but there are questions which require you to understand what chirality is. So if they ask you to identify the optically active isomer then you have to find a chiral carbon and you have to know whether or not, you know, this thing is chiral, if you get what I'm saying. So they're, gonna, they're not going to ask you to pick it out, but there are questions in which you are required to pick it out. Thank you. All right, no problem. All right, so I am to believe that I just created two enantiomers. Um, I'm not going to create any diastermers. They're kind of <laughs> weird to create. Right, but let me see how best I can show this. All right, so let me just turn on my camera real quick. All right, and in this community, we do not judge. <laughs> Hello, all right, so let's look at this. All right, can you guys see the camera itself? See the camera? So what's happening? Can you see it now? Yes, yes, no. Yes, All right. So this is a molecule specifically, right? So it would have a, a carbon in the center, right? Connected to one molecule, well, one atom here, one atom here, one atom in my hand over here, one atom here. They're all different, right? And in this case, it's the same thing, right? Technically, it's not the same thing. They're isomers, right? So they are mirror images of themselves. Like, let me hold on to the yellow one, right? They're mirror images of themselves, right? So if you can think of a mirror line going in between them, they're mirror images of themselves. But if they overlap, no, they're non-superimposable because this blue atom, right, will be overlapping this purple atom over here, right? So they're non-superimposable, but they are mirror images, all right? So I'm not sure if that helps, all right? So that's an example of um, enantiomerism. All right, there are, they're also optically active. I'm going to talk about what optically active um, means, right? So talk about like what happens with optics, right? Um, and what does this mean for organic chemistry, right? So that's what chirality really speaks about. So in this case, right, we have two enantiomers here, right? So this um, type of stereoisomer is essential is essential for, you know, the mirror image and non-superimposability, right, type of isomer. So we'll look at this. Bromochlorofluoromethane, right? So in here, we have bromochlorofluoromethane. This is an example of an enantiomer, right? So they are both mirror images of themselves, but non-superimposable. And we have that there, all right? And we also have another one, right? Dichlorofluoromethane, right? 
which ones are enantiomers and which ones are not enantiomers? A or B? I would say A. A are the enantiomers. That's what you're saying? Yes, sir. All right. Why would you say that? Um, I would say A are the enantiomers because they are mirroring each other. But if you, if I'm visually putting it together like over each other and it doesn't match. Okay. Give me another way how you would know. Give me another way how we, how we would know. Go ahead. The, the main carbon is attached to four different elements. Wonderful, right? Doesn't have to be elements, but different groups, right? So we have, for chiral carbons, we generally use an asterisk to denote chiral carbon. So we see this has an asterisk here, right? It's connected to bromine, chlorine, fluorine, and hydrogen, right? While in B, no, it's connected to two chlorines. This is not chiral. No, 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 not chiral. A carbon needs to be bonded to four different groups. You can't have two of the same groups, not chiral. All right? And that would no mean that they are superimposable. That no means that they are diastereomers in a case. All right? They are not in antiomers. Okay? So let's continue. Any questions, though? Why would it continue? Um, sir, could you visualize or explain why? The dichlorofluoromethane is a diastermer. Okay. So they are... Okay. Mm -mm -mm. How would I explain this? So diastermers are... I wouldn't... Okay, could I say that they are enantiomers? Um, okay, so diastermers usually have more than one um, chiral groups, right? But in this case, let me... Let me say that they are diastermeric in nature, in the sense that they have these same connections, right? But they can be superimposed, right? So I'm speaking about the superimposability of these, right? So actually, um, yeah, actually, I actually misspoke here, right? They're not diastermers, right? They act as if they're diastermers, but they're actually the same molecule. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, because I would actually have continued... <laughs> Um, not realizing what I said. So, they are this. It's the same molecule. This and this is the same. So, this over here and this over here is the same, but these are not the same. So, the two bromochlorofluoromethanes are not the same, but the dichlorofluoromethane, both of them are the same. Because if you just turn it around, they will be the same. So, if you turn it like in this direction, if you twist the hydrogen in that direction, they're the same. If you get what I'm saying. If you just hold hydrogen and twist it, they're going to be the same. Can you see it? Sir, so if I hold the hydrogen and turn the bromochlorofluoromethane, I would have a BR closer to the front rather than the CL. Yeah, so you're going to have something different. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? The thing is, now organic chemistry is extremely visual. <laughs> so if you're not like at your individ in your individual classrooms dealing with these things, I right, hope I do suggest that all the teachers get like model kits to help persons who are not so visually inclined to look at visual molecules. All right. But I just have a model kit because I'm enough. Um, and chemistry is a, is my bread and butter. So this is it, all right? So we have this here. So we have dichlor dichlorofluoromethane being the same molecule, right? But bromochlorofluoromethane being the enantiomers, all right? Diastereomers are different, right? So diastereomers are two molecules which are stereoisomers, right? So that means that they have the same molecular formula and same connectivity, but they have the different arrangement of atoms in space. And that's why it's stereo, you know, stereo speaks to space. So they're isomers of space, stereo isomers, right? But in this case, no, diastereomers are not enantiomers. Unlike enantiomers, which are mirror images of each other and non-superimposable, diastereomers are not mirror images. 
So they are not your mirror images, nor are they non-superimposable, right? Well, they well non-mirror images um, and non-superimposable. So they can't be superimposed. They are not mirror images, right? So the only difference really between them is that anentomers are mirror images, diastomers are not mirror images, right? Let me just boil it down to that. So we have that. Diastomers can have different physical properties and reactivity, and they have different melting points and boiling points and different densities. So like based off of, you know, the fact that, you know, that is the only difference, they are just not mirror images, they actually change drastically, right? For example, with the two, um, well, I'm not going to get into that yet, right? But in order for diastomers, um, diastomers, stereoisomers to occur, a compound must have two or more stereocenters, right? So it means that more than one, right, carbon is chiral. So you must have more than one chiral center on the molecule, and then you have a diastomer, right? So that's the only distinction we're making, keep. We're not going to further, actually. They don't ask us to treat it any further. So we just ask us to just mention the existence of these isomers, all right? So we're not going any further. But, you know, I'm going to take one step further. So let's have a look at this, all right? It may be confusing at first, right? But it makes sense after a while. All right? I want you guys to just look at it. If you have enough time and free time, just look at it and understand what it's talking about. You'll get it, all right? Because what it's basically saying is that the diastereomer of an enantiomer is that enantiomer's diastereomer. And I know that doesn't make any sense because I'm using terms that haven't been solidified yet, right? So if we have A, A is enantiomer, right? If A is enantiomer were to form a diastereomer, it would be a diastereomer of A, of the original um, compound, all right? And it's like that for everything, all right? So it's basically something like that. So let's say that we have C as an example, right? One of C's diastereomers, right? The mirror image of C's diastereomer, right? Which is its enantiomer of the diastereomer, is a diastereomer of C, right? But we're not going to go too much into that. I just put this there to show the interesting relationship between enantiomers and diastereomers, right? It's just an interesting relationship, I think, that anybody who is interested in organic chemistry could have a look at, right? But most of you guys are going to go on and become engineers and doctors. So, sadly, we won't be too interested in this. All right? So, let's have a look now. What do we mean by optically active? Because we throw around this word, optically active. Oh, stereoisomers are optically active. And then we just end the sentence there. All right? But what we're talking about is the fact that light waves interact with these molecules in a particularly interesting way. All right? In physics, you have already described the polarization of light. Um, generally, right? And what optical um, isomers or optical um, molecules can do, right, is actually form solutions that can bend the polarized light. So probably you've heard of R isomers and D isomers. The D isomers can rotate polarized light to the left and R isomers can rotate polarized light to the right. And when these isomers are found in a 50-50 proportion within a mixture, they're called racemates. They are racemic in, me in, in nature, right? In which they actually cancel out the rotation of polarized light. I know. It's interesting, isn't it? All right? So if you look at something like that, a racemic mixture or a racemate is an equimolar mixture of two enantiomers, that is optically inactive. So if we have an R isomer, as I said, R isomers rotate light to the right, S isomers rotate right to the left, right? If you have 50 50, uh, all the rotations cancel out and it's optically inactive, right? But if you have one more than the other, if you shine a light into the mixture, it won't come out on the other end of the beaker, you know, it will come out on the rotated end of the beaker. So you can shine the light on the beaker and this light will come out through the sides. Interesting, right? So you have something like this. It's, um, it's an upgrade from, a diff I think, one of the different um, 
techniques that we looked at in fourth form chemistry, right? I'm not sure if anybody can name that, right? It's one of if one of the things that we use light to really determine molecular size, determine um determine rather a molecular size, right? It's, it's one of those things. Not sure if anybody remembers it, but if you do remember, it, let me know. But it's something like this. So that's what optically active means, that they can actually bend polarized light. They interact with light in interesting ways, right? And when the, both of the isomers are found in 50-50, then their action is usually optically inactive, right? That's generally generally what it means. So we have this, if we take, if we have a polarizer and polarize um, the unpolarized light, if we put it through with the solution of a D enantiomer, right? We're going to have the light rotating so in case instead of you seeing let's say we have a test tube right instead of a light shining directly through it the light actually shine in a completely different direction because the molecules are optically active they rotate the light all right so it's something like that all right so you have the enantiomers right that rotate light clockwise and you have different types of enantiomers like um, you have D and L enantiomers and you have R and S enantiomers. So that's why the letters are changing, right? But they generally do the same thing, all right? So D and R, generally the same thing. L and S, generally do the same thing. But it's just mentioning what optically active means. So we don't just keep on throwing around the term and have no idea what it's talking about, all right? So it's something like this as well, okay? Looking at the creation of a racemic mixture, right? Five moles, five moles. That's what equimolar means. Both of them have the same amount of moles. Together, they create one mole that's optically inactive, right? So you have S-butanol and R-butanol and stuff like that. And together, they just create a butan-12 solution that's optically inactive, all right? So that's generally what we're dealing with there, all right? And if you guys haven't looked at that, most of the alcohols that are tertiary and secondary in nature are all um optically active they're all in antimers right so see if you can really look through the molecules that we deal with on a daily basis and see if we can figure out whether or not they're optically active or whether or not they're constitutional isomers or functional group isomers and stuff like that all right so are there any questions here though before we move on to geometric isomerism which is the last isomerism any questions any questions All right. Seems like everything is fine so far. But you know, if there's a question and I've already moved on, I'll can I can come back if you ask the question. All right. So geometric isomerism, we have cis and trans isomerism here, right? And we generally know what these are. So geometric or cis trans isomerism, right? These isomers occur where you have a restricted rotation somewhere in a molecule. All right. So restricted rotation. I'm going to show that restricted rotation specifically, right? But it generally means that along a, along a single bond, right, we generally have a specific type of rotation that can occur, right? Stuff can rotate around single bonds. It's no problem, right? But if you have um, a double bond, you can't have that type of rotation. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Is that understood so far? So can I repeat it, please? Are on a single bond. Single bonds allow for molecules to freely rotate, right? But double bonds do not. I'm asking if we understand how that works. Yes. So you understand how that works? Sir, sir. What was the word Consti constitutional? The first one we did, it, it's a bit like that. Oh, they're confirmers, yes, they yes, are. Yes, confirmers. So they're conformational isomers, right? But they are simply not geometric isomers, right? Because they do not contain any type of restricted area. So I'm actually building um, an alkene and an alkene to show you like why they're, they are like this, right? Because I want to have everybody having an understanding of, you know, conformational isomerism as well as geometric isomerism from just a simple explanation. And I think I'm running out of nitrogens. Hopefully I have enough nitrogen. 
All right, so I'm going to turn on my camera and explain why this is like that. All right, so let me just stop sharing for a second. So what this slide is basically saying is that, just let me know when you can see my camera, all right? So we have two different structures, right? Or we have this structure. Let's start with this structure, right? What it's saying is that this structure cannot actually form anything that is um, geometric in any kind of sense, right? Because of the single bond specifically, because of having a single bond here, it can rotate to form a conformer. So it can always continue rotating and rotating. It is the same molecule. So this is the same molecule as this, right? Because whatever substituent is attached to both of the carbons like that. But if you have a double bond, right, it's restricted. You can't actually rotate it, right? So it's rigid. And that's because of electron clouds, so the pi system that exists within the double bond, right? So it can't actually rotate. Therefore, this molecule, right, is completely different from, let's say, um, a molecule that looks like this, different from this, right? Completely different. That's really what it's talking about. Along single bonds, you can rotate. Along double bonds and triple bonds, you cannot, right? Um, and we really look at these molecules or this type of isomerism via double bonds, right? Let me know when you can see my screen again. Is it visible? Yes, sir. All right. Can you see when I move the slide? Yes, sir. All right, lovely. So we have the double bond, right? So a double bond is necessary. So, but what happened? So we have that there, right? So what happens if you have a carbon to carbon double bond for the one to dichloroethene? So we have this type of isomers. And can anybody identify these two isomers? What would A be and what would B be? Remember, we're doing cis trans isomers. Would A be cis or trans? A would be trans and trans. B would be cis. Okay, lovely, right? So A is trans and B is cis, right? So we have trans 1, 2 dichloroethene and we have cis 1, 2 dichloroethene, all right? So two different isomers. So drawing the structural isomers are interesting and naming them are interesting as well, all right? In one, the two chlorine atoms are locked on the opposite side of the double bond, right? So they're locked on the opposite side, they are trans. And then in the other, they're locked on the same side, right? Meaning cis. So cis is same trans mean opposite or other in that case, right? Across. That's what trans mean. For example, if we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, it means transatlantic across the Atlantic, right? So trans is across the double bond. And cis is same, so it means on the same side of the double bond, all right? So name these. I want you guys to name each of them, all right? A, B, C, and D, please. Have a go at naming them. Shouldn't be too bad. Let me hear the name for A. Shouldn't take too long, to be very honest. What is A? A would be trans one to E theme. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. <laughs> Listen. Um. Okay, you're going to start that again. It's trans because yes. it's across. Mm -hmm. And it has a double bond. Yeah. So it's ethene. Uh huh. And it has chlorine on the first and second carbon. Yes. So one, two. Mm hmm. Dichloro. Okay. Ethene. All right. One, two, trans one, two, dichloro, ethene, right? And that means that this would be cis, right? Yes. This means that, so this would be cis, etc. All right. Now, C, what is the name of C now? Oh, go ahead. Somebody raise your hand, I believe. Yes, sir. Question. So does like the cis or trans take priority over the number? Yes, it goes first. Because both of them are 1,2 dichloroethenes, but one is cis and one is trans. So it goes first. 
It would go first in this case, all right? So remember the naming here, right? So we have that there. So this is named as transfer isomer. We just put the transfers. No, and then we have the cis first, right? For C, what is the name of C? Please. So take trans, it on. Mm. trans 1, 2, dimethyl ethene, dimethyl ethene. Hmm. That's an interesting take on it. Okay. Not saying it's wrong. Not saying it's wrong at all. But that's an interesting take on it. So trans 1, 2, dimethyl ethene. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, is a straight yeah. chain. Exactly. Somebody's saying something. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, would it be transbio 2 in? Wonderful. All right. So what Nicholas was saying, you know, is the exact... He named literally what was here, right? But the thing is, no, chain. One, two, three, four. Right, so it's trans, right? And then you could say two butene, or you can have the but two in. So it's trans butene, and I see Victoria put the answer in the chat as well. So trans butene, right? Or you can have, well, it wouldn't be, yeah, it's trans butene, and then you have cis butene, right? So you have that there as two differences, okay? So what needs to be attached to the carbon-carbon double bond, right? So although we've swapped the right-hand groups around, right, this is still the same molecule. This is the same molecule. These are not isomers, right? This is the same molecule. You guys can see what's the same molecule, right? If you flip this upside down, yes, it's the same molecule. Okay. So if you flip that over upside down, we know that it's the same molecule. So that's not going to work. So what needs to really be attached to the double bond? Let's look at this now. All right, so there must be two different groups on the left hand of the carbon, right? And two different groups on the right hand. So on carbon one, there must be two different groups. And on carbon two, there must be two different groups. That is how we define these geometrical isomers. All right, so that is what is required. All right. If you only have one, then it's the same molecule. You just flipped it. All right. So that is that. I remember you have a, have a double bond. So you restrict movement. Um, okay. Sir, can I go back to this one? Can I see the difference? Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. You see it now? Yes, sir. All right. No problem. All right. And this one, no, we have two groups attached across the double bond all right, for each carbon. All right. This, no. But you could make things way more difficult, right? And have even more interesting geometrical isomers. So how would you define these isomers? Hmm? Let's look at this now. If you make it more difficult, right? You could actually just... Okay, let me not do that. How would you name these isomers? These are completely different. How would you name this? It's interesting. I don't think we have a naming system for this. Let me check the syllabus real quick. Yeah, the syllabus doesn't even go close enough to start naming this, right? So you can have these types of isomers and you can even have where all the groups are different. And that is where you come to a university level um, isomerism when we talk about EZ isomerism, right? All it talks about is the fact that the groups with the largest atomic numbers, right? If they are on the same side, so these are the largest ones, they are Z because they're on the, well, same side. Hello, well. Right? And the ones with the large um, atomic numbers, if they're across from each other, they're on the other the ends of the double bond. But we don't talk about that in Cape. It's just an example of, our, of the rest of the type of isomerism. So we, I, don't, I don't actually go into it. Right? So... These are the different presentations of isomerism that we see. So in, in Cape, we look at geometric isomerism, which is cis or trans isomerism. We looked at stereo isomerism or optical isomerism, some people call it, right? Or spatial isomerism. 
And with that, we looked at enantiomers and diastereomers, right? We also looked at different types of conformational isomerism, such as ring chain isomerism, positional isomerism, functional group isomerism, right? And conformational isomers, right? So that's basically it. So coming back to this chart originally, if the both molecules have the same molecular formula, they are isomers. If not, they are they are not isomers, right? If they're the same connectivity, they are stereoisomers, right? If not, they are constitutional isomers, and you have to figure out which type of constitutional isomers. Are they functional group isomers? Are they positional? Are they ring chain, right? And if anybody decides to put on, you know, their big boy or big girl shoes and start looking at tautomerism and stuff like that in higher levels of chemistry, then you have to figure out that type of, you know, constitutional isomerism, right? But let's say that they have the same connectivity. Are they non-superimposable uh, mirror images? Then they are enantiomers, right? Do Are they not? Then they are diastereomers, right? So you have stuff like that. Notice that geometric isomers aren't on this, but it's in the PowerPoint, right? Are there any questions or concerns for me, though?